Okay. Welcome everyone, everyone to the uh, regular meeting of the Planning Commission on the state of November 15th. We're going to start with a Pledge of Allegiance, and that'll be led by Victoria Carranza. And if it, all the other commissioners can please mute their, themselves, that would be great. All right, thank you. Okay, everyone, please stand. And Randy Hughes, Commissioner Hughes has the flag, thank you. Hand over your heart and let's begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you and thank you for bearing with me with my hoarse throat. <laughs> thank you, Victoria. Um, why don't we get a roll call, please? Okay, Commissioner Anderson? Here. Commissioner Carranza? Present. Commissioner He? Present. Commissioner Hughes? Present. Commissioner Schmidt? I can see him, but I cannot hear him yet. Um, Vice Chairperson Keene? And Chairperson Van Den Eyck? Here. So it looks like we have uh, six present and Dennis is here, but um, we'll, we'll hopefully he'll get back on in just a little while. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, can I get a motion to approve the agenda, please? I'll make a motion. Jason, can I get a second then? Oh, who, who did the I'm motion? Muted, Jason. Second. Okay. All right, we got a person and a second. <laughs> Commissioner He? Yes. Commissioner Anderson? Yes. Commissioner Carranza? Yes. Ah. Commissioner Hughes? Uh, due to the fact that I was absent, uh, I believe I have to abstain, correct? No, we're just approving the agenda oh. for today. Okay, yeah, approve. Okay, uh, Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. And welcome. Um, Vice Chairperson <laughs> Keene and Chairperson Van Den Eyckhoff. Yes. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you. Uh, this portion of the meeting is our public comment portion. It's open to the public to address us on any matter that is not on the agenda. Uh, for those that would wish to address us, if they could state their name for the record before making their presentation, they be limited to three minutes. So if there's anybody online that would like to make a, make a public comment on something that is not on the agenda tonight for the Planning Commission over which we might have a jurisdiction, if you could please raise your hand if you are in um, Zoom or if you're on the phone, you can do star nine to raise your hand. I think it's actually maybe star six to or raise. Star six. <laughs> Okay, I'm not seeing any um, any comments, public comments. So we'll go ahead and close that portion of the meeting. And can I get a motion to approve the consent calendar, please? Motion. I'll second. Okay, and if we have a personal second. And uh, you're muted. Sorry, Commissioner Anderson? Yes. Commissioner Carranza? Yes. Commissioner Heath? Yes. Commissioner Hughes? Yes. Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. Um, Vice Chairperson Keene? Commissioner Van Den Eyckhoff? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. Um, Chair? Chair? Yes. Did anyone try to get a hold of Commissioner Keene? Yes. I okay. uh, I talked to her today and um, she said she would be here. Okay. Well, okay. Hopefully she'll be on soon. Yeah. She might be having some technical um, issues on her end. Okay. Then we will go ahead and move into the public hearing. Um, for each of the following items, the public will be given the opportunity to speak after a staff report. The chair will open the public hearing and invite the applicant or the applicant's representative to make any comments. 
Members of the public will be invited to provide testimony to the commission following the applicant. Speakers should state their name for the record and can address the commission for three minutes. After all public comments have been received, the public hearing will be closed and the commission will discuss the item and take appropriate actions. We'll start with disclosure of ex parte and we'll start with Greg. No ex parte. Okay. Jason. No ex parte. Randy. Yes, I have ex parte. I spoke with uh, Michael Woody, a civil engineer, who is also representative of the um, Selene and Indian tribe. He's one of the 12 on their council. Uh, Victoria. I spoke with a couple of stakeholder groups in the riverbed area, um, one being the Slow Beaver Brigade, and I did speak with the Northern Chumash Tribal Council. Uh, Dennis. No ex parte. Okay, and none for me as well. So we'll go ahead and turn the time over to uh, staff to make a presentation. Okay, thank you. Bill, I don't know, sometimes you like to do an intro. Do you want to do any kind of intro here? Or... Do you want me to do a preamble? I was going to do a, <laughs> a follow-up after. Well, actually, oh. let me just do that while I have the, while I have the table. Um, as you know, there's a lot of letters that you've received today. And uh, more importantly, there's one letter you did receive from the Northern um, Chumash regarding um, recommendations for a phase one. We're going to discuss that a little bit later, but that does change our viewpoint on this project. It does change our recommendation. It does change our conditions on the project. And um, you're going to end up with a couple different options here in the end. You're going to end up with an option. Well, obviously, the, the typical options are always approve, deny, or continue. Um, but we're actually going to really talk about that a little more in depth and the requirements of doing archaeology on this property and, and when that can occur and how that can occur. But let's uh, go through the presentation because a lot of this information we received just today. So let's go through the presentation. Let's hear about the public testimony. And I'm going to provide a little more input on those topics as we get into that discussion at the very end. OK, great. Thank you. So um, the project being presented tonight is for a new recreational vehicle or RV storage yard. Um, this is a conditional use permit, which is why it's coming before the Planning Commission at 6805 Sycamore Road. So the project site itself is around 23 acres total, um, the area being leased to the RV storage yard proposal is about six acres. The zoning is in the industrial zone. Um, for the most part, this property is that purple area that's all industrial. Um, and then that green part along the Salinas River is actually the open space designation, um, but that is not going to be impacted um, by the development as far as the development actually crossing the boundary of the zoning. So it's the whole project is just being encompassed in the industrial zone. So here we can see an aerial view of what that looks like um, in the area that we're talking about today. So you can see that sort of orange line is the six acre area that's proposed to be leased for the RV storage. In the front there, there's an existing construction yard. Um, I believe it was previously Ramina construction. I'm not sure if they're still there, but it is still being used as a construction yard. Um, and then the rest of the site is just to remain vacant. That's not a part of the project at all. Um, so the only part that we're talking about is actually the orange outlined area. So a little bit of background about this site in general. In 2007, the City Council did adopt a zone text change to establish a new plan development overlay zone. This was plan development number 31, and this was for a proposed BMX facility at the time. This facility was never constructed, um, so the property has remained vacant as it is today. The site is currently owned by a Tascadero Mutual Water Company, and like I'd mentioned before, it just has that one construction yard with storage buildings in the front corner there. The Design Review Committee did review this project this summer and proposed the, that the project made um, a few changes regarding new and existing fencing, as well as some recommendations for landscaping on site, and we'll go over those. 
So the project actually being proposed, again, is a new RV storage lot with a total of 262 RV parking spaces. Um, and I'm sorry, this would be RVs and boats. Um, they're in that RV category or vehicle category that would be stored on the site. Um, so phase one includes 138 parking spaces and phase two would include 124 spaces. And we'll take a look at that phasing. Um, the RV storage lot use is allowed in the industrial zone with conditional use permit approval. So the Planning Commission will need to approve this tonight in order for it to proceed to um, happen. So here are the phasing um, parts of the project that I'd previously mentioned. Again, phase one includes almost 140 RV parking spaces and a new perimeter fence around that entire area. Um, staff has added a condition that the De Anza Trail be realigned with this first phase um, to make sure that that's done. Currently, the De Anza Trail traverses through sort of the middle of the site. There is a trail, but um, it's not super clearly defined. So they will need to move that closer to Sycamore Road. Um, and we'll talk about some of the requirements that go along with that, but they are required to do those improvements with phase one prior to finaling construction permits for that. Um, and they'll also be constructing an entrance gate into the RV storage area, as well as a stormwater basin, which um, is obviously required in the first phase. And phase two in the blue there includes, like I'd mentioned, 124 additional parking spaces. They'll remove that fence that's dividing phase one and phase two. So it's all just one open lot. And then they'll extend all of the fencing along the back there um, to uh, cover that whole area as well. So moving on to landscaping, um, this was a discussion that came up with the design review committee and one thing that staff recommended and that the design review committee was supportive of was that the applicant focused taller vegetation between the trail and the RV storage lot. Um, so this would act as a screening or a buffer between the recreational trail and then the industrial storage lot. And in addition to that, while having taller species along the storage yard, we want shorter species along Sycamore Road. And the reasoning for this is to prevent that from becoming a hidden corridor. So it'll be fully landscaped um, to clearly define the trail and you know, in an effort to beautify the, that trail, but it won't make it like, um, a space that you feel enclosed or people can sort of hide out in. Um, and that has been added as a condition on this project to make sure that those landscaping requirements are met. So there is some landscaping proposed along the front fencing area. This is the gate that would be um, where people are coming in and out of that storage lot with some new landscaping around the front there. Originally, the applicant did show landscaping along the edge of the property there, but after discussion um, at the design review committee, the applicant expressed that they really were concerned about adding landscaping throughout the site for a couple of different reasons, one being the maintenance. Um, they'll have to uh, you know, irrigate that landscaping and then they'll have to make sure that people don't drive over it, which will be, um, which could be difficult in this type of use here. And then also the lot itself is, um, it's in the industrial zone um, and it will not be very visible from the surrounding properties or from uh, Sycamore Road itself because of how far back it is. So the applicant is requesting to remove that from the landscaping plan and not provide landscaping actually throughout the RV storage lot. Another topic that came up at the design review committee was landscaping in front of that existing construction yard. Right now it's um, it's sort of just bark chips that are down there. There's no defined landscaping that's been planted or irrigated there. And since this, uh, since that 
part of the site is not actually being touched, but the um, it's all one parcel, and this is a significant project on this parcel. Staff recommended at the design review committee and the design review committee supported adding additional landscaping there in front of that construction yard. And so what that basically means is that all along Sycamore Road will be landscaped um, with a landscape plan and irrigation and will need to be maintained. So um, this is really in an effort to make that whole area look a little bit nicer. And just to touch on what's actually there right now, there are six coast live oak trees that are existing along that construction yard and where that new uh, gate will go. And these are to remain on site. They're not proposed for a removal and these are to be protected during construction. The municipal code does require that at least 5% of the lot in these industrial zones be landscaped. Um, oh. And then I have a note that that will be verified prior to the planning commission hearing, but that was actually um, something that the design review committee discussed as well. Um, the applicant is requesting an exemption from this requirement due to, again, maintenance concerns and vis visibility on the site. So at the DRC, they requested to remove that landscaping within the site. Um, and the design review committee was clear that they supported um, a lower percentage of landscaping based on the feasibility of it surviving, the nature of the site, and the industrial zone itself. Um, so the site will be screened by fencing and landscaping all along Sycamore Road, um, which would again make the landscaping difficult to see and difficult to maintain. The municipal code does allow the planning commission to approve a modification to eliminate that minimum landscape requirement if a finding can be made that the existing vegetation, topography, or structural arrangement precludes that need for landscaping. And based on the location and maintenance, staff, as well as the design review committee are recommending that the planning commission allow for this modification to only require landscaping along Sycamore Road, all along, like we had just discussed, along that front edge, and then also along the De Anza Trail. And now moving on to fencing, um, there is an existing six foot tall chain link fence along the Eastern property line and along that construction yard. And in order to avoid creating a hidden corridor again for the De Anza Trail, staff is recommending, and we've actually added a condition per the DRC's recommendation that the fencing along Sycamore Road be um, removed. If right now it's a six foot tall chain link fence, so that fence would be removed and replaced with a fence that has a maximum height of four feet, and that's either a split rail fence or a pipe rail fence to be um, to add some protection and some delineation between Sycamore Road and the trail, um, but not prevent uh, people from being able to see onto one side or another. So to keep that area transparent. Um, the municipal code does require that all new fencing be vinyl coated chain link fencing. Um, when it is chain link, it has to be vinyl coated as well as screened with evergreen vegetation. Um, the fence along the Salinas River will not have any evergreen vegetation. It's not proposed to have vegetation. One, again, for the maintenance concern. And then two, um, the site is flat, basically completely flat in front of the Salinas River. And then there's a pretty tall berm that goes just behind where that new chain link fence will go. So the applicant is requesting not to plant that evergreen vegetation for screening based on the actual visibility of it and the maintenance. Um, and then at the design review committee, the applicant also requested to repurpose the chain link fence along the front here. Um, and instead of just basically getting rid of it, the applicant is requesting to use that along the uh, Salinas River along the back here. Um, so it won't be that vinyl coated chain link, but just normal chain link fencing. And um, that was something that the design review committee also found that they could support because um, again, it will not be visible from um, the from Sycamore Road or really from any of the adjacent properties. 
So lighting insecurity is typically a concern with this type of use. Um, so the applicant is showing seven new light poles proposed with a maximum height of 20 feet tall. However, staff recommended decreasing this height to 16 feet, and this is just in an effort to reduce light spilling onto adjacent parcels, onto the Salinas River. Obviously, it's a sensitive um, habitat over there, so we want to make sure that um, it provides the safety that this type of use requires, but does not negatively impact the surrounding uses. The applicant is also proposing, and we've added a condition that the lights stay at dim low levels until motion is detected. And once motion is detected, they do brighten up. Um, and the applicant currently does with their current uh, storage business, and they will continue to contract with a local security company that provides 24 hour coverage um, if something does happen there. And another condition that we added uh, regarding the lighting was that the applicant provide a photometric plan with the construction documents, just showing the light spillage onto the surrounding sites and making sure that it's um, minimal and contained basically entirely on this one site. And this site plan just shows where exactly those new light poles and those security cameras are proposed to be located. So these red circles here are the new light poles that again we are conditioning to be no taller than 16 feet tall. And then the purple squares, which might be a little harder to see, are the proposed security cameras and those are what the applicant is providing for obviously uh, security of the site. So here are some photos of the site. As you can see, again, it is a, a completely flat site basically as of right now, up until that berm right before the Salinas River. Um, so that top picture is where that new automated gate would go. And then if you see on the right to that of that picture, that's where that existing construction yard is. And then that bottom picture is um, looking down Sycamore Road. Again, these are just some more pictures that were taken on the site. You can see that it's pretty flat. They'll be um, removing that chain link fence that you see there and replacing that with that lower split rail or pipe rail fence. And then that uh, bottom picture you see there that will be um, looking toward the area that phase two will be in. You can see that existing construction yard there and um, there's really no real landscaping there at this point. And that's one of the reasons that we are proposing that they plant landscaping and include that in their landscaping and irrigation plan. And then you can see on that bottom picture, the existing downs, a trail entrance, um, which will remain about in that location but they'll um, obviously just be replacing that fence and adding some landscaping and then they'll be realigning it once you actually get onto the site. So there are quite a few conditions of approval um, on the site and we can certainly go over them. I'll just sort of go over each one quickly here. Um, so the conditional use permit shall allow basically what's being proposed, the RV storage yard. The landscaping and site improvements shall be maintained and in good order. The no changes to the fencing, landscaping, or site improvements can be installed prior to um, approval by the city. They cannot store cargo containers in operable vehicles, inoperable boats, um, or any basically inoperable RV on site. They can only store currently registered and operable RVs or vehicles on the site. No storage of vehicles in any location other than those designated on site shall be um, allowed. No other land uses shall be allowed in conjunction, conjunction with the RV storage unless it's approved by the city. They are not allowed to wash any of the vehicles, RVs, or boats. They're not allowed to dump any of the RV waste. No storage, uh, paving, stockpiling, grading, or use of the site shall be allowed within 30 feet of the top of the bank of the Salinas River. Um, and that berm really acts as sort of a buffer there. So they are 30 feet off of the actual bank of the Salinas River there. The realignment of the trail shall be consistent with what's shown. The trail shall be completely completed and fully landscaped per the approved 
landscape plan. Any modifications must be approved by the community development director and generally taller vegetation must be focused between the RV storage lot and the downs of trail with shorter species between the trail and sycamore. The existing chain link fence adjacent to Sycamore and the aligned Dianza Trail shall be replaced with a split rail or pipe rail fence. Um, all new fencing, all new chain link fencing um, shall be vinyl coated with a dark neutral color. They are allowed to have bi barbed wire on top of that fencing. Um, that was per the design review committee's um, answer to the concern of safety again so they can have barbed wire but not that constantine or that circular wire that you see um, on prisons um, so that can be added along the fencing on the storage lot um, the existing chain link fencing along sycamore road can be repurposed and used as fencing adjacent to the salinas river as we've talked about Applicant shall submit a landscape and irrigation plan focusing on the following areas that we previously just um, talked about. We also want to ensure that the Deonza Trail realignment is built to meet equestrian trail standards. That's something that the design review committee was specific about. Um, we've limited the maximum height of new poles, light poles to 16 feet tall. Um, again, we're requiring that photometric light study. And then the use permit shall be subject to additional review upon receipt of operational complaints. Additional mitigation may be warranted upon verification of recurring noise or operational disturbances. So um, if the, basically this is sort of a condition that we add sometimes um, when there's particular concern about a certain use. So this allows us to, if we do receive a lot of complaints and something is obviously not working with the site, um, we can revisit it and make sure that we're reducing the um, impact to the neighborhood. And previously staff did have a condition that archaeological monitoring be required during all ground disturbing activities. So they would have to have a monitor out on site during any grading activities. Um, but we'll go ahead and talk about some revisions to that as Phil mentioned. And our public works department did add some conditions of approval. The second one, I just wanted to note um, that they are required to, with their building permit submittal, provide um, basically a plan for if there's any kind of oil spill out there. Um, and with that plan, they need to provide details of, you know, how they're going to clean it, who they're going to contact and all of those things. And that's something that our, um, our public works department will want to see and approve prior to us issuing a building permit over there or construction because really they're not building anything. Um, this really just includes some grading and um, grading for that new retention basin. So I do just want to highlight the findings that have to be made tonight. And if one of these findings cannot be made, that would um, mean that the Planning Commission cannot approve the project. So the findings that have to be made, and I do have descriptions for why staff found the um, findings to be made without within the staff report. The proposed project is or use is consistent with the general plan. The proposed project or use satisfies all applicable provisions of the zoning ordinance. The establish establishment and subsequent operation or conduct of the use will not um, basically be detrimental to the health, safety, or welfare of the general public or persons residing or working in the neighborhood of use. The proposed project or use will not be inconsistent with the character of the immediate neighborhood or contrary to its orderly development. The proposed use or project will not generate a volume of traffic beyond the safe capacity. The proposed project is in compliance with any pertinent city policy or criteria adopted by ordinance or resolution of the city council. And finally, there's that uh, finding about the vegetation and that is that existing vegetation um, Topo existing vegetation, topography, or, or structural arrangement preclude the need for that additional landscaping. And that is the finding that will need to be made to um, 
grant an exception for that 5% requirement of landscaping and industrial zones, as well as the evergreen screening along the rear fence um, on the back of the site along the Salinas. So the project qualifies for a class four categorical exemption from the um, California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA because it's consistent with CEQA's definition of a minor land alteration. Um, it's important to note that the site does appear to have previously been graded as it's completely flat with that berm built up back there. And they're not proposing a lot of grading on the site since it is so flat. So they'll be, um, you know, trenching for lights and building that retention basin, um, but they aren't proposing significant um, grading or new construction on the property. However, um, as you saw in the comments today, we did receive a comment from a local Native American tribe who was concerned about the impacts of uh, local uh, Native American historical resources on the site. So we do want to address that. And so um, within that letter, you probably saw they're requesting a phase one archeological study to be completed. Um, and from there, basically working with the tribe to um, make sure that any negative impacts are resolved before, um, before anything negative happens. So with that, staff has actually revised our recommendation and we have two options that we're proposing to the Planning Commission tonight. So I'll go over those now. The first one is that the Planning Commission adopt draft resolution approving the conditional use permit, allowing a new business that includes outdoor RV storage in the industrial park zone with an amended condition number 24. So instead of requiring just that archeological monitoring um, during construction, that condition will now say that the applicant shall complete a phase one archeological study prepared by a qualified archeologist. And that would need to be done prior to issuance of any construction permit. If this phase one study results in a phase two recommendation, which is the, uh, the next level of archeological study, if phase one results in a phase two recommendation, then the applicant shall complete this phase two study. And if archeological resources are identified, the applicant shall consult specifically with the um, tribe that sent that letter with the particular concern, the Northern Chumash Tribal Council, and contract with a tribal cultural resource monitor as requested to be present during graded ac grading activities. Um, however, if results from the survey and the consultation result in an alteration of the proposed project, so in other words, um, the applicant cannot uh, modify their project um, or do their project without significantly modifying it, then this approval will become null and void and the applicant will have to return to the planning commission for approval of the conditional use permit. So essentially, if what they find in those archeological studies uh, makes the applicant have to redesign their project, then they'll have to come back to the planning commission and your approval here will um, again be null and void. Right, I wanna make sure we also have um, a condition there. Should we end up this way that we still maintain an archaeological monitoring like if, for example if they complete a phase one and don't require further archaeological study that we still have the monitoring during ground disturbing activities so okay. is that is that the case and i think that was what our intended recommendation would be we can we can add that we can get there later let's just see where this evolves go ahead and continue your presentation apologize for that Okay, yeah, um, and we can definitely massage that um, condition. And the second condition, or I'm sorry, the second recommendation is that the Planning Commission actually continue this item to a date uncertain to allow for the applicant to complete this phase one archaeological survey and any subsequent surveys resulting from the, fi uh, the findings of that phase one survey. Once the archaeological surveys have been deemed complete, the applicant shall then return to the Planning Commission and request approval of the conditional use permit, um, and that will include any recommendations that came from those surveys um, 
any yeah. recommendations will have to be implemented with that moving forward to the planning commission at that time. So the planning commission has three options in this case. Um, the planning commission can approve modifications to the project or conditions of, of approval for the project. That's the first option that we presented to the planning commission um, in our recommendations. The second is that the commission may determine that more information is needed and refer the item back to staff. So that's that second recommendation that the commission uh, has determined that the applicant actually needs to complete that phase one survey prior to approving this project. Um, but if the commission decides to make this decision, then the commission shall clearly state the type of information that is required and move to continue the item to a future date. And then finally, the commission can go ahead and actually just deny the permit if they find that at least one of those findings cannot be made. However, the commission does need to specify the reasons for denial of the project and specify exactly which finding or findings they um, are unable to make with this. So I know that's kind of a lot and we can certainly discuss that end part there or you know, obviously the whole project, but we are available for questions at this point. Thanks, Mariah, that was, that was great. I'm just gonna add one more little piece to this because this is these projects can be challenging and there's a lot of good public comments that we should really take into consideration um, that speak to this area and to the river but i also also want to just point your direction to the fact of the zoning of the property that is not something that we control today and is something that was in place since 2002 with that general plan and probably with the prior where the land was designated for industrial land uses, um, and we have very little industrial land in the city, and the environmental determination evaluated that being developed as industrial at that time. <coughs> Although this property has been owned by the water company, so the options for development have been very limited, and in this case, it's just a lease. But it's very important we also look back to the findings that Mariah presented in this case. Um, if even one of those findings can't be made, we um, would suggest that you can't support the project here as well. Um, so I think staff really just trying to present all the facts to you, remain completely neutral in a recommendation. Um, it's sort of an interesting land use because it doesn't have essentially development on the site. It's just using the site, I'll call it for an interim land use on a lease property on land that really what the city actually envisions permanently on this site is development very similar to what we see right now at the Sycamore Industrial Park. So there's a lot of comments that, that talk about preserving this site for open space, um, but it's really not one of the options we're given in terms of how the property is designated today and um, isn't really on the table for discussion. So what's on the table for discussion is whether this conditionally allowed land use is appropriate in the industrial district given this particular neighborhood this particular situation and given the conditions that we're suggesting and given all the information has been entered into the record based on public comments today as well so um, anyway let's go ahead and get into questions and then we can hear from the public and we'll take it from there thank you great thank you staff um before we go into the actual public hearing portion, we'll open it for questions of the planning commissioners of staff. Anybody have questions of staff? Dennis. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, do we have an aerial photograph that shows the relationship of the Highway 41 crossing to the property? Is it is it like a thousand feet away? Is it a football field away? Do we know? That, that relationship? So you can see on this aerial image, it's pretty, I don't know exactly the distance. I can look into that, but um, you can see about the edge of where this project stops. And then this would be the highway right here. So okay. it's a pretty good distance, but the highway does sit above. So you'd probably be able to see it, I'm sure. Um, thank you. Um, I was actually kind of surprised the, little industrial yard there to the east of the project or to the southeast is zoned residential suburban uh, kind of surprised by that 
but um, are there any existing light, is there any existing lighting related to that industrial complex or the uh, corporate yard? Um, I don't actually know what the existing lighting situation is out there. So that might be a good question for the water company. I think they're here. Um, you know, I was very appreciative of, of the conditions that you included. Uh, one, though, I was a little bit surprised that it wasn't included was um, no one living in the vehicles or using the vehicles. I mean, um, I, maybe uh, the security that the developer is going to provide could prevent things. But uh, say I want to have a party and I need a nice loud spot, I mean, a spot where I can make lots of noise. It seems like I could park my RV, have an RV parked there and have a, have a party. Um, and so um, there's a lot of conditions that talk about how the RVs can and cannot be used, but there's nothing about occupancy, which I'm a little surprised. Um, and then I was interested in knowing more about the security services and how they, how they operate. Uh, is it a 24 hour situation or is it an on-call scenario or is it uh, uh, five days a week of Monday through Friday from eight to five and not on the weekends? So I'm interested in seeing how that, that functions. Um, and then lastly, with the potential requirement for our uh, cultural resources study, does that change the CEQA determination at all? Um, being that we're basically saying there's potential for something to be there. Uh, and, but yet I, I imagine that we're saying we, we're exempting it. Uh, and I'm wondering if that's, the, if that's allowable. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll start with the first question about that condition. Um, I know that we intended to have a condition that no one live in the vehicles. Um, I, that might have, I might have not read it or it might have been left out, but I'm certainly, that's not what we are looking for. And I know that's not how the applicant wants to operate the it's site. It's also important to note that it's not an allowed land use in that district. We don't allow any dwellings, uh, whether it's transient occupancy or permanent occupancy in the industrial zone. So already by zoning, that would be restricted, but I think it'd be wise to add that caveat. Well, yes, um, the only reason why I discuss it is I, I, I have seen people live in uh, storage units and yeah. uh, and yeah. so and it's not allowed there either but yet it no. happens it happens yeah and and certainly it's probably it wouldn't hurt to add that if, if we were to head towards that direction we could talk about that I also I'll let Mariah continue the other ones but I do want to mention CEQA real quick because that's a really important one and as I mentioned before this site appears to be previously graded. We are in um, the industrial zone. We're not developing a building or doing significant landform modification to this site. That's where that exemption has come from. We received that letter from the tribe today. So that's why we decided to go ahead and go forward with this hearing and discuss this. Have we received that letter prior to publishing this staff report and prior to posting that the environmental determination, we would have requested a phase one analysis prior to completing that work and moving forward. But here we are, that came in today. And so that's why we have an option there to continue, or we have an option to condition this to take care of that study after we, the planning commission looks at it, but prior to granting any construction on this particular site. And if we need to, we would amend an environmental analysis on this site if that phase one comes up positive that there this is a site. So at this point, it's not a mass site that we're aware of. There's no creeks on the site. There's no environmental issues on the site that would have triggered an environmental analysis other than the speculation that's in a letter, which is, a, I mean, it's a credible situation because Native American finds are very, very common along the Salinas River. And there's a number of instances where that has occurred in the city of Atascadero. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
And then just going back to, I think your second question, Dennis, about the security operation. So I don't think I described how exactly the, um, the site will function. So I do want to talk about that. So there actually is not going to be anyone working on site. It will be completely self-service. So with that gate, you'll have, you know, a code or, or some way of letting you in. Um, so it's entirely self-service. Um, and then the security operation, the owner actually owns another um, RV use sales lot in Atascadero, and they currently use a security service. Um, it will provide 24-hour security, and but I believe that's fully on-call security seven days a week, um, and the applicant will be on to describe that more if you have more, more questions. Okay, thank you again. Uh, Randy, go ahead. Okay, I got a few questions. Uh, these will probably be for, uh, for the city. Uh, so the site's already been graded before. So were there ever any studies as far as tied toward potential Native American impact as far as artifacts, stuff like that, archaeological finds before? Not um, that we are aware of on this site. No. Um, okay. But there, there's definitely archaeological finds in other areas very close by. Uh, the Lakes Project, for example, was a very significant archaeological site. Um, and in fact, a couple of years ago, there was a burial found on a nearby site as well, south of this area. So okay. it's very common. This 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 was a very common area where you're, you know, going to potentially find archaeological discoveries. Okay. And one of the main things I saw in the emails that were sent to us were um, concerns of water contamination from oils and gas from the vehicles. And I know this area well enough to know it. I believe it's kind of fairly close to our well system for the Tastera Mitchell Water Company. It's up off the back of the river there. Um, but I believe all their testing stations are there. So do we have any statements from the water company? I mean, if they're doing testing close by, do we have any statements that they would be able to see if there are any issues or that all be tied towards the environmental studies? In uh, terms of testing for uh, contamination on the site? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, because it seemed like a lot of the emails, they mentioned that there were concerns of a water potential of water contamination from vehicles being stored on the site. And I mean, it's right next to our, uh, it's within reason as far as close to the well stations. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. I feel like the water company would be testing that really at yeah, an average rate. They test it consistently. And I think that's a great question for... Um, Okay. The water company, but this site isn't directly attached to the river and separated by that huge berm. But yeah, anything that's going to soak into this ground potentially long term does become part of the aquifer. And that's why they do have it draining to a basin on the site. But still, sure, just like anything else, just like a parking lot anywhere else in the city that drains to the creek, which many of them do, it's, that's a very um, logical okay. concern. And then, just like um, the parking lot for the industrial site next door drains directly to the creek, the whole thing does, so, or to the river, for that matter. Okay, so that'll be something I can ask the water company on. And then I got one last question. I was a little confused, just maybe on the wording of how the documentation came in. So is the Northern Chumash tribe directly affiliated with the San Inez Chumash tribe that's south of us? I, I'm not sure about that. Um, we We give all of the the affiliated tribes an opportunity to comment on projects okay and um the, the reason i'm asking is you know i'm looking up uh the federally registered tribes and i don't see a northern specified but that i mean this area i was looking into it i know that the salinan tribes i was looking into i mean all the way back to the san miguel land grants um the salinan tribe had stuff that went all the way close to ag so i know that any findings in this area could be contested by multiple tribes thinking it may yeah, have been there's some over, there's some overlap in there in the, the planning areas for the tribes and northern chumash uh, okay. definitely overlaps that with selenian so yeah it, the, the only reason i bring that up is like i know there was some um, contention with them like over moral rock um you know one tribe has the ability to go up during the solstice and there was some debate over which tribe's uh, jurisdiction that was mm -hmm. so i would just be concerned like depending on what the findings are here it might open the can of worms of some debate over whether it's a, a burial site or if there's any archaeological findings who it belongs to. Mm -hmm. So I, I I do like the fact the last um, the last suggestion you guys gave as far as saying hey we can kick it down the road and have this research done first. It, it just mm -hmm. I'm just kind of scratching my head a little bit on it. 
Yeah, it's certainly an option as we get this new information that comes in. Okay. Well, thank you. That's that's all for now. Uh, Victoria. Okay. And I know all of my fellow commissioners know this, but sometimes I'm in and off the camera because I have a one-year-old. So I was listening the whole time, but I had to go put her back in the crib. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm going to reserve some of the questions for the property owner, Tassie Mitchell Water Company. Um, but I do want to ask a couple of questions that I think are staff related. So did you all... Um, make any specific recommendations because I didn't really get that answer from the report about parking access and making sure that both the RV people are going to be able to access their storage unit if trail visitors are potentially blocking that zone and then if trail visitors are allowed to access it as they normally do right now which is anytime they want. So I, I wanted to ask about that. Um, I also wanted to ask about the realigned De Anza Trail proposition. So along that thread, yes, I think it'll be mostly improved. However, what wasn't really cited, at least from when I read it, was how big the corridor for the trail was going to be. Once the vegetation is mature, is that going to leave room for people to walk? Is that going to leave room for horses to go through? Um, and in general, just accessibility for trail visitors um, once the landscaping's matured? Because it 10 feet is going to be, in my opinion, too small. I was thinking of something more like 30 to 40 feet, but I didn't see anything called out specifically around the trail uh, corridor. Um, setback, I guess, for that is what you might call it. Um, and then the other one. Oh, in regards to CEQA, so yeah, I mean, as far as visibility, this is six acres. I know that's very obvious on paper, um, but I'm potentially wondering, uh, and my fellow commissioners, we can talk about it later, but with the city for questions right now, what kind of visibility study has been done other than the maps that we've had access to um, and is staking out that acreage a possibility for us to talk about later after it's physically mapped out, like where things are going to be laid out? Because I just don't think that we can see the magnitude of this project and the footprint um, with what we're given tonight. So I think that's it for now. Okay, sure. So um, to answer your first question, I can certainly find the details, but just for reference, um, I know that this drive aisle, if you can see my mouse, is 30 feet wide, and that's per our fire department standards. So I would imagine this is 50 to 60 feet wide, um, but I can definitely look and see exactly what that is. Um, and then we haven't had any, we didn't request the applicant to go out and actually stake exactly where all of this is, um, on the property to provide, you know, a picture or something for the planning commissioners to be able to see actually on the site. Um, so at this point we have this aerial image, but I agree it's a large site um, and six acres doesn't look that big when you have a large site. So um, it hasn't been mapped out at this point. Um, on That's the something ground. the commission can ask for either if they continue, uh, continue this project or otherwise, that is something that um, the commission can certainly request. Do you that's know what that's called, uh, Phil? I, I mean, do I have to call out a specific uh, it, there's no real specific okay. name for it other than right. just marking the site and sure. staking the area. And sometimes people will use um, snow fencing to stake out an area, which is that orange tree protection fencing that we use. Sometimes they'll just stake the area with little ribbons, little the little pink ribbon flags on them so they can stake generally the boundaries of where that is. And I think that might be the most ideal in this if they just had 
uh, simple last stakes with um, ribbons on them, you know, every, you know, 35 feet or so. And then you can kind of generally get the idea of the, the story scope of, of it. Yeah. The, yeah, that, you know, because you know what the height's going to be. I mean, RVs are 16. Yeah, 16 foot high yeah. or, or so, or eight feet, 10 feet high sometimes. And there's sometimes boats with big covers can be a little taller. Um, so generally that's what it's going to be. But I think knowing the area is a good point because it's a good size and it's hard to, it's hard to see that. Um, and it might give us a better idea of how it's viewed from Highway 41 when you're up high in the bridge looking down across this area and what that looks like. And that's certainly a, something to consider. Okay. Was there anything else, Mariah, that you didn't? To... Oh, the parking. Oh, the parking. So um, let me go to this. So um, right now, and I actually cut it off, but right now this is the parking area for the trail. So this will remain, um, this will be unchanged. They'll still have the access to the trail here. Basically the access point will stay um almost the same and then the trail will obviously be realigned closer to sycamore and then this entire yellow area will be fenced off so the um the people with the rvs will be able to go in and out of the gate and then people who are wanting to go on the trail will be able to park here but if someone's just going on the trail and doesn't have any business with the rv site then um it's my understanding that they wouldn't be allowed to go in the gate. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. The only other thing that maybe would be for the applicant, but, or I mean the property owner, but I think this might be city because of the history is the cutouts near 41 and the step throughs for access for wildlife. Curious. Cause that wasn't necessarily called out in this project. Um, I don't know, Phil. Cutouts. Where are where are those cutouts? Which which cutouts are you referring to? For you larger mean? animals, other than like raccoons and skunks, I'm talking more like um, coyote. Yeah. I guess would be the same size, so more like deer or mountain lion. Or so you're referencing a wild a wildlife corridor. Yeah. So I know that in the past, um, and yeah, I guess maybe I could ask AMWC directly. Um, yeah, right now the whole this whole site's fenced with a barbed wire fence with a six foot fence with with a barbed wire on top of it. So um, it's pretty secure already. I don't know that there's a corridor on this site because it's the water company site, um, other than the access point to the trail, and that won't change with this project. So, but good question. I think we should ask water company about that. Okay, thanks. Any other commissioner questions? Right, I had a question. Um, there were some specific um, conditions by the Public Works Department. If I saw correctly, didn't one of those um, call out for oil pans or something under drip pans under vehicles to make sure they didn't get oils or? Um, so yes, I believe the intent, and we can clarify it if it's not clear, but um, the intent is to provide drip pans and spill kits for leaks or spills. So if they're having issues, uh, or if RVs are having issues, they need to have those on site and be able to provide them. But it's not like when you drive in, you automatically right. get one. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Jason. All right, thank you. Uh, I just had a question. So this property is owned uh, wholly by the Atascadero Mutual Water Company, correct? Correct. And how are they they going to manage this property? Who's who's in charge of that? Do they have other properties they manage this way, or will this be the first? So the water company is um, they would be working with a lease with a private. Uh, owner or private operator basically who would rent or lease this property for this use and then they would actually operate it so the water company isn't necessarily operating it but they're leasing it to someone else who will operate it okay and do they do they uh 
already lease property that they own to companies such as this? It has happened in the past. I don't know if they have any other current leases, um, but this this particular site or adjacent sites have been leased to storage areas and different uses over time. Yeah, okay. that Ramina construction yard is on the same property um, and that's being leased to. I'm not sure if it's Ramina or another contractor. Okay, because it, it gets a little more difficult because Tesco Mutual is a publicly held, you know, company, you know, the stakeholders hold it. So it's a little, it's a little muddled because, you know, they're acting on behalf of the people of the Tascadero or the stakeholders. So it, uh, I just want to make sure that this this isn't opening a can of worms that they've never or they've never drawn before. So, um, does that make sense? Or mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I think John Neal, if he's on later on, can speak to that kind of a topic. But I know that they've had leases for quite some time, and um, and just for everyone else's knowledge, you know that is clearly separate from the city, and the city would not have any benefit from this becoming a storage yard. We would not receive any revenue from this particular lease. We wouldn't see, receive any revenue from the operation here at all. Um, it, it doesn't provide anything for an, an economic benefit. So I want that to be really clear as well. Okay. And so that the, the, the monies that would be received to the, uh, the water company would simply be um, held in their. Uh, yeah, in that's, their... that's, that's right. There's no share to the city. There's no um, we don't receive any additional tax revenue even from this kind of a project. So um, that's just some, just not really a decision factor in terms of the findings we need to make um, for a use permit. But just while you're talking about that topic, it's just worthwhile knowing that and for the public to know that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sales tax. I don't think there's any sales tax from this project at all. There's no sale going on here. So... Unless people are buying new RVs and parking them here, and they're buying those RVs in the city, which I suppose is a remote possibility. But how about TOT for RVs? No. <laughs> <laughs> if we could figure out a way to do something here, it'd be great. But I, I am that's going to take a, a vote of the community. So we could sell air fresheners. <laughs> yeah. Victoria, do you have another question, Steph? Yes, I'm so sorry. I didn't say it earlier. Um, I was trying to comb through my notes of which ones were city and which ones were other. So I was researching about land use for this particular area and just how it's been talked about to the public. And I came across a, it's called a Salinas River Trail Map Master Plan from 2014. And it talks about the different reaches that they're trying to make because essentially the document is a plan from the San Luis Obispo County of Governments that comes, uh, that collaborates with San Miguel all the way to Santa Margarita, and they want to connect everything, 36 mile stretch. And so part of that reach, they talk about reach two, and it's that, I believe it's this project site that it would be part of. Um, mm -hmm. And I just... I, I'm curious about knowing that next year we are looking at updating the general plan, knowing that this was already an existing master plan, but so far as I know, it's kindling because I don't, I've never heard of it. Um, but I just didn't know how, what, how alive is it? And is that at all on the forefront um, and, and thought about, or does this project not involve it at all? So just because once we make this decision for this use, it's very unlikely it would be torn down. So mm -hmm. that's a great comment. And that trail plan is alive and it is active and segments of the trail are built. And we're looking at building other segments of, to connect other communities. In fact, we're working on a connector trail right now that would connect a Tascadero to Templeton that would mm -hmm. essentially be in the wow. spirit of, of this pathway. Now, this particular project is not going to impact the trail it actually provides for a better access and maybe a, a cleaner access to the river trail okay. the trail actually ends here today it ends at sycamore road comes out to the roadway and then you have to travel south on sycamore road through a residential district until you can join up another segment of the trail because the salinas river 
um, gets a much deeper channel um, behind the Sycamore Industrial Park. So it's trail routing is generally where, where they're building it with this project. So they're, they're implementing basically a part of the trail plan where it doesn't really exist today. Right now, it's, there's a trail there, but it's just roughly, a, you know, in the middle of a gravel lot. And instead- so it's incongruent with that master plan yeah. then. Yeah, so this matches okay. that. It doesn't, it doesn't block it, it doesn't change it, but okay. it matches it. And um, that's a key factor um, in this case. To, to consider and so it's alive and well. Randy. So I was gonna tie tie up with Victoria on there because uh Jason kind of brought up a good point earlier as far as the water company being private having the stakeholding. And if we were to shoot this down, that would also be potentially shooting down that tr us future tying that trail together from how I understand. I mean there's nothing that we could do that could say hey if they were to hold on to the property, it's got to implement, you know, this other project that's going on. Um, well, the so, trail's already there. The trail's there either way. It's just not as formal as we'd like to see it, um, but it's there. And th that's not going to change whether this project gets approved okay. or not. So it so. seems like th this plan, though, is going to go parallel with the development, though. So if this plan does move forward, it's going to make that trail concept move forward. It's it's going to beautify it and kind of help connect everything. It appears to. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions of staff? Okay. If not, we will open up the public hearing portion of the meeting and invite the applicant or the applicant's representative to address us. Okay, so I think um, Don McAdam is on, and Don, if you're on, if you wouldn't mind just uh, pressing star six to raise your hand, so I know which phone number. I can look it up. Oh, we'll get John Neal on. So would you like me to unmute? <laughs> This is John Neal. Hi, John. I've Hi, been John. talking for the last 10 minutes. I'm, maybe you missed it. <laughs> so um, I, I, I just go through some of the questions I heard um, and I maybe provide some answers. I think Phil characterized this really well early on that this we view this uh, as an interim use of the property. Uh, it's certainly not its highest and best use, uh, but it is a use that will generate some revenue for the water company, which we put into our operating and maintenance accounts uh, to offset uh, water rates. Uh, we do have several leases through the city, uh, in the city. A lot of those are cell site leases. Uh, we also have land license agreements, et cetera. So we do know how to manage a lease like this. Uh, that existing county yard, we call it the old county yard where Ramina Construction was, uh, that's under a triple net lease. Uh, that we use as a framework for all of our leases. Uh, those leases require the applicant, uh, in this case, to adhere to all the conditions of approval imposed by the city. Plus we have some of our own, uh, which mirror the concerns the city has, especially with, with the release of hydrocarbons or people living on the site. Um, Phil touched on it, I think, well, the entire city, <laughs> drains to the Tascadero Creek, Dove Creek, and the Salinas River. There's hydrocarbons going into this system all the time. It really wouldn't matter where this site was located in the city, that water's gonna end up in the river. So if we have a way to mitigate that adequately with spill protection kits, drip pans if they're appropriate, and just a reasonable amount of monitoring, I think the risk is pretty low. Uh, but we have the same concerns you do uh, and we have provisions in the, the lease that we have a framework for now that address those, those particular issues. Uh, Dennis asked how far the site was from the Highway 41 bridge. It's, a, it's about 1,100 feet, Dennis. Uh, existing lighting at the site, there's some minor lighting at the, uh, the yard, the construction yard. Uh, other than that, I'm not aware of any. 
And then as far as access points, you have the access point that we, we discussed here this evening to the De Anza Trail. And there's another access point about 2000 feet to the north uh, near our corporate yard that's open to the public. So you can access uh, uh, the site at, at both of those locations. And there's some limited parking at each of those locations. Uh, any other questions for me or? Go ahead, Victoria. Yeah, hi, John. Hi. Um, I think, and maybe you just said it, but I didn't catch it quick enough about the any step throughs or cutouts for wildlife. We did have, oh, years ago, we had cutouts in the fence for wildlife, but we were having issues with trespassers and people using them for illegal purposes. Yeah, other corridors. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. And that, that's a big problem for us down there is the, uh, the homeless population. We're constantly fighting it. And from my perspective, there's more of a risk from their activities <laughs> as far as pollutants than there are probably from this site, which is gonna be managed. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Randy. So you mentioned as far as um, all water gets ran off through a very select set of locations. And um, as far as you expect that risk assessment of contamination would be a minimal, um, do you have testing locations that are close by? I mean, I feel like if you do, you would see right away a spike in hydrocarbons and pollutants. We actually have a well on that site, okay. a monitoring well. Uh, we call it our well number 15. It's okay. sort of the, the southeast corner of the site. Uh, we have monitoring wells all along the Salinas River, uh, and we sample the water from our production wells on a routine basis. Okay. Yeah, because I'm, I'm a utility worker and I vaguely know as far as I believe there were certain backup gas generators back there. So I, I loosely know of it. So I kind of figured you would have so, a lot of testing right in that area. So, I mean, if the pollutants was there, if um, the party that's causing pollution was close by, you would probably see a spike really quick from that testing location, correct? I, I would anticipate yes, depending on the conditions. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. All right, thank you. That's all I got. Any other questions for the applicant, Tori? Sorry, I lost my voice this weekend, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, you did you did say that it was an interim uh, use for the site. How long is the current lease, and like how long do you see the in, this as being the interim use? Uh, the initial term of the framework, we we haven't entered into lease agreement yet with the applicant. Uh, we're still working on that. We have a framework, uh, but the, the initial term of that is 10 years. And what ultimately do you see in that space? Uh, right now, we basically, it's vacant land for us. If somebody came along with a project uh, and submitted a proposal to us, we would consider it. That's how we got to this point with... Uh, with VS Marine, they they approached us and said, "Hey, we're interested in leasing this property." Got in fact, it. I get I get these type of you know these type of calls on a pretty regular basis. I had one for a similar facility back in November of 2018. They wanted to do an RV storage lot. We could not come to terms with that particular applicant. Uh, they did not want to adhere some of the requirements that we were going to impose on them, especially as far as. The, the type of uh, equipment they were gonna store on the site and so on. And so here we are, uh, we were approached back in December of 2020 uh, by VS Marine for this. And the board considered their, considered their proposal and they thought it was worth moving ahead with. And VS Marine is a local, they have another place in Atascadero? Uh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Randy. Just one last question out of me. Um, you mentioned that the revenue that this would generate would be used to offset, um, essentially it would go into your guys' maintenance budget. Um, is there anything that is going to guarantee that that's going to happen? Uh, well, that's all we do is maintain a water system. We have no other ventures out there. 
um, all of our sell, for example, all of our revenue we generate from sell sites goes into our operating and maintenance fund. Okay. Yeah. The, the reason I'm asking is, is like, if I just want to make sure that it's actually going in that, because like if revenue was used to all of a sudden attain another property and then we have the same situation, it's almost can become like monopoly. Um, that, that's not our primary business. Uh, okay. You know, these properties were deeded to us back in 1913 by E.G. Lewis and you know, we see an opportunity here to to raise some additional revenue that again goes into the kitty for operation and maintenance. Awesome, I'm I'm glad to know that. I just I just had to ask. I was I was curious because um I know um you guys are a private entity in its own way, and so I just I was I've always wondered kind of how the situation would work with um, where you guys have an asset like this where someone would want to be doing a lease or a business plan on it. So thank you for your clarification. Yeah. The fundamental difference, revenue like this, we do get taxed on. Revenue that we generate from water sales, we don't. That's how we keep our nonprofit status. Any other questions, of John? Okay, if not, we'll go ahead and open it up to the public for comment. Um, if you would like to make a comment on this, please uh, raise your hand and please state your name for the record. And you'll have three minutes where you can address the, um, the commission. Hi there, can you hear me? All right. Uh, my name is Audrey Taub. I'm a homeowner in the city of Atascadero and a customer of the Atascadero Mutual Water Company. I'm not in support of the RV storage on Sycamore Road. Um, I wanna quote the uh, Atascadero Mutual Water Company website. The Atascadero Mutual Water Company and the city of Atascadero allow the public to use their properties that front the Salinas River. Many enjoy daily walks along the Juan Bautista de Anza Trail. It is the Tascadero Mutual Water Company and the city's desire to maintain these precious riparian corridors so we can all enjoy them for many years to come, end quote. I do not think this project is in alignment with maintaining these precious riparian corridors. This river is a beloved resource to our community and beyond. I'm a part of the Slow Beaver Brigade, a nonprofit organization based in Atascadero educating our county on the benefits the beavers provide our area, including our depleting groundwater basins. We give educational walks out to beaver ponds on the Salinas River within the city limits of Atascadero. Over the two years, we have brought hundreds of people to these beaver ponds. People from all over Atascadero, Slow County, Santa Barbara, Cuyama, the Bay Area, have traveled here for the sole purpose of visiting these ponds. A research scientist from CSU Channel Islands, Dr. Emily Fairfax, has been studying these ponds for the past two years. Additionally, this 2022-2023 academic year, we're sponsoring two Cal Poly Master of Science in Environmental Sciences and Management students to quantify the carbon sequestration potential of beaver ponds on the Salinas River. One group of Audubon members on our tours nicknamed this area the Riparian Serengeti because of the numbers of bird life present on their walk. It is a precious riparian corridor used frequently by many different folks inside and out of our county. Please consider denying this proposal. The riparian corridor is not an appropriate location for the RV storage facility. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Audrey, for your comments. Ellen. Hi, I'm Ellen Bayreau, a former council member and mayor and planning commissioner. So I appreciate all of you for being here tonight and taking due consideration for uh, what is being proposed. Um, I'm familiar with conditional use permits, and it is com completely up to the public to decide whether uh, we allow this conditional use. So. Don't be afraid to put community interest above uh, the possible interest of the person wanting to do this project. I do not feel that this is compatible with the surrounding uses. In one of the slides, it indicated that it is surrounded by open space, residential, and the 
De Anza Trail. So I don't see anything that says, you know, 260 cars being parked. And, um, and then some of the considerations, well, hold on a sec. Um, and then the other thing that is, is really important about a conditional use permit is, is there um, community benefit? And I remember when the BMX park was being considered and we really weighed that heavily on whether we could do something like that next to the Salinas River. And um, it was considered good because, you know, you, it serves um, a section of our society that needs places to recreate. But in this situation, um, there really is no community benefit. And I think that's an important um, consideration. And also, and I appreciate Victoria's comments that this is a huge storage facility. And I think it's hard to wrap our heads around what 250 plus vehicles would look like. And um, it is uh, south of the 41 bridge and going over that bridge right now is just beautiful. If you look north, you look south of the 40, on that 41 bridge and you see the whole Salinas corridor. And to disturb that with putting in a storage facility like this, whether it's 10 years or or more, um, I, I don't see that as a positive for our community. Um, one of the things I know our community has been working on is um, attracting more tourists and tourists like to see uh, the beautiful environment we live in and having a storage facility in the middle of all that um, would not be um, positive. And that leads me to some of the conditions, um, you know, saying, oh, you don't have to screen because it's not seen from the road. Well, there's a lot of people, you know, like the Beaver Brigade and other people who use the Anza Trail that um, will see the chain link fence and things like that. So I, I don't recommend that we eliminate um, any of the screening and maybe put more thought into that. Um, um, there was something in saying that they wanted an exemption from the municipal code of 5% of the, um, of the of the property or the site be landscaped. So that's about a third of an acre. And instead of just exempting them from that, I think um, also as Victoria um, pointed out that you need some space for that um, relocated uh, trail. And so 0.3 acres is the 5% uh, code rule. And that sh should maybe be applied to that area um, as a buffer and um, creating, um, you know, so you can try to ignore that huge storage facility if this goes through. I, mean, I actually think you should just continue this item while uh, the archeological uh, decision, the phase one uh, project is, is, is uh, put through. Um, Cause a lot of things may change uh, with that process. And um, we could be you know, spinning our wheels and spending a lot of time and energy trying to put something together now that will just be changed in the future. So I, I would start. Comments, it's been uh, over three minutes. Thank you. Ellen. Okay. All right. Well, in general, I, I oppose the project and I think it uh, needs more work and consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have any other people from the, oh, here, uh, any other attendees that would like to speak on this item? If you're on um, Zoom, if you could raise your hand. Devin. Yeah, good evening and thanks for uh, my quick comments here. I'll keep it quick since it's getting late. Um, I'm gonna say that I'm in support of this project. Um, I trust the Tascano Mutual Water Company for vetting uh, all applicants that continue to come to them for the process of uh, leasing their property um, with the continuing rise of cost and maintenance of everything and their new PFAS uh, mitigation systems. This is a way to keep the cost of the water for the municipal department of Atascadero down. Um, and this project still allows access to the trail and all the riparian area that's down in the creek. It's more of the flat land that is going to be uh, improved for a storage lot. Uh, the other nice thing I like about this project is it's not at the north or south end of our city. When people come into town, that's not the first thing I see. So thank you for your consideration and I'm in support of this project. Thank you, Devin. Any other, yes. Uh, 
Um, with any, I see Ellen has her hand up again. Do we have any other, before I, I allow her to speak again, is there anybody else that would like to speak on this item? Okay, Ellen, we'll bring you in again, if you could keep it brief. Thank you. I, there's just one uh, other aspect I, I wanted to mention is that with the increased um, traffic on Sycamore Road, most of our roads need help whenever we can possibly give it to it. And, and when you think about the fact that there's going to be RVs and trailers going in and out of there all the time, um, is, is there going to be any infrastructure improvement to Sycamore Road, such as uh, a bike lane, uh, repaving of the frontage of that project, possibly widening the road um, because of the um, extra use by RVs and trailers, and um, if any traffic study is going to be done. So that's my questions about that. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't see any other people that would like to make any comments, so we'll go ahead and close the public comment portion of the meeting. We'll bring it back to the Planning Commission to discuss. Um, I don't know about, I see Tori's hand is up. Maybe I could, I'll, I'll make a comment before we move to Tori, but my, uh, my initial um, thought is that we continue this item until we hear, until we receive the uh, phase one study from the archaeological survey, because I, I don't think we can um, go much further beyond that. But I'll just leave it there and we'll have other comments. Tori, you were first. I agree with you um, on the continuing it to an archaeological study, but I did have a couple questions for Phil if he's still around. Oh, look, he magically you? appeared. He's like I a genie. I am GD. here. I'm always here. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so two questions. One, can we limit the um, like the amount of space? Like, let's say, um, without the archaeological study, just like if we were going to pass it tonight, could we limit it to just like say phase two, so that the it would just be like behind the construction yard and next to the industrial park? Um, and then the second question is, is can we put a time limit so that when the lease um, expires, would they have that they would have to reapply for a conditional use permit for an extension on the lease? Yes, those are within the realm of conditions of approval so that they can specify the use area and specify the timing of the land use. Those are all appropriate for any conditional use permit based on the characteristics of what they're proposing. Because I really like what they want to do with the trail, making it prettier, putting a nice fence, all of that. But I realized that in order to get that, we might have to give them a little bit of space. But six acres is a lot. But at the same time, I think continuing this out until we get an archaeological study is completely, I'm 100% in favor of that, to get more information on what's in this area. Uh, Randy. Yeah, I just want to say I'm, I'm right in line with you, Jeff, on that. I mean, the fact that they had a discovery kind of close by would kind of put the process that there may be a chance that they might find something. So I do agree. We probably need the, the finding. Um, as far as for like the black and white here over findings on what to shoot down with, this area is kind of a mixed bag. It doesn't see, I mean, you have industrial, you have some residential close by, and then you have the, the bridge there. So it's, I mean, there's nothing that's really dedicated saying it's solved one way or the other. So, I mean, as far as like the elbow room and all the other things that our general plan mentions. I don't see like a legal black and white to just shoot it down, but I do think for us to move forward in this process, we do want to be educated on uh, what the archaeological finds are because that could just completely shoot everything down before a shovel hits the ground. Victoria. Yeah, I mean, I would even like to make a motion that we table this item and we um, also, in addition to letting the archaeological study unfold, um, do a visibility study, because I think that's a huge aspect, literally, figuratively, all of, all around. Just we need to be able to see this. Um, it you cannot fathom it on a piece of paper, and especially an eight and a half by eleven. Randy, did you raise your hand again? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I do think that's kind of a good idea. I mean, because on the paper, it is very easy to overlook like how big six acres is. 
I just, I do think it's interesting. A lot of people are quoting like from the bridge, you can see this, but did anyone ever do the same thing with the visual expectation when the bridge is being instructed? Because when you're walking there, I mean, those big concrete pillars right there, I mean, sure. same argument can go the other way. But I, I do think that um, just looking at this on the computer screen, it's really easy to overlook. A quarter of a nice mile thing. from the 41. <laughs> yeah, so I, I can I can see where your where your rational come from, comes from. I think that's a good idea. I live on three acres, and then I was thinking, oh my God, twice the size of my property covered in RVs. <laughs> that's a lot of RVs. So I do think that... Um, if we could get together, I don't know if, if we're allowed to all be there um, or how that would work, but to get it staked out and see exactly how big six acres is, I think that might well, you be don't have to all be there at once. You can go visit. You know, oh, that's true. Site. That's you true. You time. could just have someone stake it out and then be like, okay, guys, go see it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think I we had to coordinate and stuff. Um, I guess I just want to comment that, uh, I mean, uh, there was a big controversy when we built the bridge there at okay. one time. We have a corporate yard for the water company there. We have the railroad running through that area. So although uh, there are sensitive portions around the site, it's, uh, there is a lot of disruption right there now without this project. Uh, I don't know how, how many of you have driven uh, Sycamore Road, but uh, when I drive it, I drive 25, 35, everyone else wants to do 60 uh, through that area. So there is a lot of disruption. So uh, um, just wanna maybe extend, if we're gonna consider doing these additional studies is to have them also consider the environment of where the site is. It, it is not necessarily completely pristine at this point. And so that should be part of that analysis. Hey, Victoria. Yeah, I mean, there was talk about, you know, this having no community benefit. Um, I mean, I would like to acknowledge that we won't know what RVs from where are going to get parked here of the 200 60 something RVs, but it would appear to me that one community benefit, if anything, I'm like trying, um, would be that they would get off of the lots in the neighborhoods. So we wouldn't be seeing <laughs> ghastly RVs in people's neighborhood parking lots. But I would also assert that I'm thinking that a lot of the customers would be people from Fresno, Bakersfield, out of the area that want to park their RVs and, and come weekend warrior it. So we don't, I don't really have to talk more about it because there's no way we could pinpoint who the users would be and if that would really be a community benefit or not. Um, but I guess I just wanted to bring that up, you know, uh, for sake of community benefit talk. Well, the other thing you could consider is that the mutual water company benefits us all. And if yeah. they make money, our rates, you know, Sure. The same. Somebody did put that in an email that if it were up to us as the citizens that have a stake that they thought, I forget the email, but I think y'all read it, that they would think that if it was put to a vote of water users, that we would just rather have a higher water bill than whatever revenue they're going to get from this RV storage per year. So there's that too. I mean, I don't, I can't refute it or, or agree with it. It's just something that I read in an email. Okay. Sorry, I do want to just interject really quick. I know the applicant was trying to get on and speak during um, the applicant representing the uh, operator, Don McAdam. Um, so if there's any time that he can come back on and speak, I think he would appreciate it. But it doesn't have to be right now. <laughs> well, I just want to. I think Victoria made a motion, right? Like that was an official motion. Uh, I don't think there was an official. Motion. Okay. I, I threatened. She it. just I, said, I, "I want to make a motion." Okay, got it. Got it. Yeah. And with respect to Victoria's comments about community benefit and other comments, I think the one gentleman who spoke, uh, I think, was very observant and. Uh, identifying what John Neilha talked about, which is the funds that are generated from this are used to help maintain the system that we have. And um, to me, that's a huge community benefit for, for everyone uh, for that to occur. 
I also, that's also why I specifically asked whether we can put time limits on this. I mean, if they really want this to be an interim use, then, you know, we put the, we put the conditional use permit to the length of the lease so that if they go 10 years, then in 10 years, we can revisit this. And maybe by then the general plan will have rezoned this and it will be, you know, used for something else, or, you know, we'll get an industrial park in here or something, but, um, you know, this is, if, if we're going to trust anyone to maintain the Salinas River, it seems like the water company would be the ones looking out for it. So I think that uh, I will actually make a motion. Um, I, I, mo I make a motion to continue this to an undetermined date um, based on the archeological study and also ask that the city uh, goes and stakes it out as they see appropriate. Um, the, the whole use of the, the six acres so that um, we can go see exactly how big it is. And do you need any other words in there, Annette? Can you change that to the applicant? Oh, oh, sorry, the applicant does it. Yes, I'm sorry. The, the applicant, applicant doesn't say, thank you. I was just going to mention that. Sorry, Otherwise, but the applicant Mariah, Mariah, stakes get it out. And, stake that tomorrow? <laughs> and I'll second that. that to her. I'm sure Kelly has nothing better to do. Yeah, she's not. <laughs> okay, we had a first and a second, and I apologize to the applicant's representative. Um, this will be coming back to us, and we'll give you a chance to talk to us at that time, but we, we want to give um want to give you opportunity to get those studies done okay um are you ready for me yes okay vice chairperson king yes commissioner hughes yes commissioner anderson yes commissioner carranza yes commissioner heath yes commissioner schmidt no Mr. Person Van Den Yes. Motion passes 6 1 to continue. Thank you very much. And we'll look forward to seeing that application resubmitted once those, that phase one study has been completed. And uh, please let us know when the survey has been completed so we can go out and take a look at it. Jeff, you might make your movie. Hey, that'd be <laughs> awesome. Um, okay. We'll go ahead and get a director's report. Thank you. Yes, a couple things. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about an invite you probably got as part of a stakeholder group to speak with our general plan consultants. You're invited to do that. It did mention there that you can bring some people along. I'm actually suggesting that you just go alone to this. We we made that same suggestion to the city council members and. Um, you're certainly welcome to recommend that additional people become part of that initial stakeholder group. This is a really early information gathering sort of discussion. It's not um, really, we haven't started our, our big public outreach yet because we haven't finished our background gathering data and we haven't um, gone to the city council yet to really let them know how we're going to do outreach and what we're doing and discussion of all the big topics. So this is kind of a preliminary um, early discussion. You're going to get a series of questions from our consultant team. It's really good. And so it's your opportunity as kind of a key stakeholder in the community as part of the planning commission to kind of provide some early feedback to the team as to the direction we're going with the general plan update. So if you can make it, it's great. They're going to be meeting at, um, at uh, Brew Coffee. Um, there might be some other potential locations. I think they've got 10, 11, 12 people signed up so far. Um, they'll be inviting various folks from different stakeholder groups throughout the community. So it's important that you stay tuned with that. Again, this is an early opportunity. There's many other opportunities coming for public outreach. We're going to talk about this topic at the city council as well um, on December 13th. And then we'll start doing more community out, uh, community wide outreach in January, February, and March of next year as we develop a lot more information. So a lot more to come on that. Uh, I do want to tell you about your next planning commission hearing. We'll be talking about the pro the vacant property next door to the fence factory, and that is pr proposed to be a um, equipment rental yard and a Bobcat dealership. And they're going to build a new building there and put in a parking lot and do some road improvements there on that longtime vacant lot that's been kind of a gap in between two development sites along El Camino Real across the street from the Emerald Ridge Apartments. So. 
That one went to DRC. It's now coming before the Planning Commission to review a use permit. We'll take a look at that. And then um, other than that, we'll hopefully everyone will be starting to enjoy the Thanksgiving and, and Christmas holidays that are coming up. There's a little bit of staff time that we'll be out in and out of the office, but for the most part, we'll be around. And I'm here to answer any other questions you have about stuff going on in the community. Yes, I see your hands up. Um, did I read that the next meeting is on the 15th of December? No, I think, um, yeah, the city council's next meeting is on, um, well, actually, we have one next week, and then we have one on December 13th. Um, our next meeting is December Annette. 6th. Thank you. December 6th. <laughs> I'm not looking at the there, there is a DRC meeting on December 15th that we were looking for a quorum to have a meeting. Um, I'll just note right now, I, I mixed up the two. Um, uh, my son who lives in Thailand is getting married. And so my wife and I are going to be Brad. dressed up in traditional clothing in Thailand and going to enjoy a wedding. And so Wonderful. that's on the 18th Congrats. of December. So we're really Fantastic. excited about that. That's and wonderful. then um, I want to know, um, the, obviously, we city council made changes uh, to the ADU ordinance. Is there a handout or something that uh, explains the changes that have been made or describes what has what, what now. Uh, there will I have be many people asking me now what there is, and it's all it, top secret information. Is it is it codified <laughs> at all? Can I, can I look in almost the code almost? So head? it's it's um has it gone through second reading or does it go through second reading next week? Let's see. I'm just trying to think of where we're at. I think we're going through. Anyway, it's going to be codified soon. It's not codified yet. And we still have to get endorsement from the state, from HCD. But we will be working on a handout. We will describe to you exactly what's happening. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and if any of you are interested, I can email you actually the draft code um, that is heading on its way for um, the codification. In other words, it's gone through second reading. It'll go through the 30-day period here real soon. Um, I'd appreciate and that. And that's moving forward. But in general, um, there's all new laws that, that are pertaining to ADUs, to SB9 lot splits, to SB9 urban dwelling units, um, a lot more flexibility, but at the same time, a little more restriction on the maximum size uh, of ADUs. We've come down to a thousand square feet in general, unless you've got you know, larger property and different situations going on. Um, a lot more concern to for controlling properties that are not served by sewer or in certain fire hazard areas. But the big thing is we're also going to have free plans for you. You can come pick up a free plan from the city that's already pre-approved. And in many of those cases, you won't have to do a, a soils uh, analysis of your property. Um, and if you build it, that's, you know, if it's less than 750 square feet, you're also going to be exempt from development impact fees. So we're seeing a lot of new ADU construction now, and we expect that after this goes into effect and after we have the stock plans available, we'll see a lot more, and that'll continue forward. And that's really good because we see it as a form of affordable housing in our community, which is really critical to support our workforce. So, I guess generically, are there restrictions on lot sizes for septic system and for lots that that are on community sewer. Uh, if I have a half acre lot, can I put an ADU? Do I have a quarter acre? Can I, I can't do it. What type is anything like that in there? There's no lot size limitation if you're on sewer. There is a lot size limitation if you're not on sewer. Um, and so I can send out to the planning commission that draft code, what it looks like. There's a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, the planning commission, I believe, had recommended that wiggle room coming down to a half acre. The city council put it back up to three quarters of an acre, um, getting more in alignment with the regional board, um, and you know only if you know that system can accommodate it. So, a little bit of wiggle room there, but generally, yeah, we need a larger lot size for those and um, other limitations. If you're in an area that only has one way out, like the neighborhood I live in, is going to be somewhat restricted to ADUs, but still allows 
junior ADUs, which are part of your existing residence. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Victoria, were you trying to raise your hand? Yeah, Dennis's last question about what the Planning Commission's recommendations were to the City Council and how that all panned out on the draft. I'd love to take a look at that in detail. So if you could send that, that would be great. Yeah, we, we actually went back a couple different times and they were very, very thorough. They really went through and there was some changes uh, to some of the definitions and some of the things such as the detached accessory structures and the attached accessory structures to ADUs and um, in terms of the size limitations and some of the objective design standards. So I can I can definitely forward you uh, that, but I think what they did is actually really um, well thought out. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions of Phil? A quick question. Yeah. Um, the development at the corner of Del Rio and El Camino, the new one that's going in, there's a Taco Bell. My goats are very excited because they love cinnamon twists. Um, <laughs> I had heard, I got a question from the community. They had heard that a gym was going in there. Do you know anything about that? What is going in those buildings? We have not heard about a gym. Uh, we don't have any announcements on tenants for the other buildings at the corner of Del Rio and El Camino Real that are behind or in front of uh, where the Taco Bell is going. Those were designed to be sort of restaurant or retail spaces. Um, is there a gas you know, station that's going on, on that corner? On a separate property, okay. not owned by Clint Pierce, in between the hotel and where that Taco Bell is, right. there is a gas station proposed. They are in for construction permits. They haven't actually pulled those construction permits yet. We assume they're going to develop that. It just it hasn't happened yet. That's been in the approval process now for a couple of years. So that may happen. It's a very different kind of gas station, real custom gas station. It has a very different format to it. It's called the Pit Stop, and it actually has some electric vehicle charging stations on it oh, as cool. well. So it's a, a different, unique product. So we'll expect sure. a Starbucks to be moving in there soon then? <laughs> that would be ideal. It'll be our, what, our fourth one or something, our third yeah. one. And... I mean, the more the merrier, right? <laughs> yeah. But uh Right? They are moving forward with plans to do the, the marketplace uh, across the street, which will have the Valley Fresh, uh, some other yes, retail spaces. I saw spaces the fences going up stuff. on my way to work, yeah. So that's going to be starting soon as well. We just finished looking at the first round of the construction plans for that, and that's looking really good. So um, hopefully that moves forward. And what about the other side of Del Rio? Any movement on um, the RV Park Convention Center? Yeah, Thing. Not a lot. They're they're continuing to look at different options in order to make their financing successful on that property. Um, so it's stalled a little bit. Um, we'll see where that goes in the near future here. And I heard they put up their Santa Barbara Road for sale. Duck Creek at the corner yes. of Santa Barbara and El Camino Real is on the market. That's right. So is that Five not acres. moving forward then at all? Not at the moment. So it's kind of okay. in the same status as Del Rio, El Camino Real. It's sitting idle um, and uh, trying to maybe, you know, potentially sell those properties as well. So. Maybe we can convince Valley Fresh to put one in there too. <laughs> need something. We definitely need something at the south end of town to serve all the customers that are down there all the way as far as we do. Santa Margarita and Duck Creek itself and Las Lomas and yeah, and yeah. it's just, it's sort of a food desert down there. So I, I hope for something to happen to serve that community, to make it walkable. Okay, I'll let someone else ask questions. I've gotten all my items checked off. Jason. Well, I'm really interested in keeping Jeff from his movie. So I'm going to read the intro to the Odyssey from Homer. So oh, he's got 10 minutes. It's 7.50. That's right. He said he had something at 8 o'clock. Oh, yeah. I I, okay. I, uh, I suggest we end this so that uh, Jeff can get off his movie. I have one. Work. Just oh, sorry, Victor. After, after, sorry, after I know. I, we love you, Jeff. We do. Um, okay, so mine was in regards to just piggybacking what Tori was asking about the, you know, the bowling and the microbrewery and the fishing from the little mini cabins. So that place we talked about as the commission doing something like a temporary use permit for them to start marketing some of their stuff. And the city said, okay, we'll look at that because that's not really allowed. And then the commission said, no, I think we should allow it. So just maybe that could be in our next meeting if you had anything on that, or maybe it's a done deal. 
they have not come back in with a request to do a temporary sort of site. They were, they were supposed to come back in with a development plan and would outline what they would okay. like to do and get a master plan of development. They haven't done that. So All it's right. really, it's, it's in their, court, in their right court. now. Yeah. Yeah. To move forward, we would definitely accept um, something that proposes something temporary or long-term and um yeah, it would benefit everybody. I think our commission talked about that. So, okay. Thank you, everybody. You thank you for uh, <laughs> thank you for sticking it out. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, adjourn our meeting till the next scheduled meeting. And until then, we'll see y'all later. Have a great night. All right. Goodbye. Okay. Good night, everybody. Have a good night, everyone. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.